جزاك الله خير فرد من الحكومة سيحيد الله جزاك الله خير مسيح بوكر بوكر لأجل هذا It's a very important um, topic and work to the high to force that we saw often as well. It's a reminder for us, everybody, and as well as living in this country, laws and regulations change quite often. So it's good to keep updated in terms of how we send our loved ones at the end, you know, towards before they pass away, as well as after they pass away. How do we do a respected way and in a quick manner as well? Uh, just a couple of things before we start. One is, please, um, nobody take record or take pictures. Um, there's some brothers who, um, I mean, we can record it anyway, so this will, this will be uploaded. And you don't need to take notes. I have sent, I mean, the slides I use, it's very concise, but the detailed slides about 80 or 90 pages altogether. I sent it to some of the brothers. Thanks. Today they will send it out to everybody at the end, inshallah. So you don't need to take notes, you don't need to take pictures. Everything is detailed um, in terms of step by step. Um, so the workshop that we we host we, is three parts to it, um, or oh, should we say two parts? The first part is the theoretical side where I'll go through in terms of before a person passes away, all the way to at the end, how a person is sent off, even after burial, how it, it is anything required and so forth. And the second thing is that also the practical side where we um, practically show how to perform the uh, the the. Uh, the last funeral rites, when we say, before a person is buried. Um, in the theoretical side, there's two aspects to it. One is the fiqh, uh, what, is, what does Islam say about in terms of writing a will, end of life care, and so forth. And there is also the theoretical side of, in terms of living in this country, what are our rights as Muslims, as well as how do we swiftly send our loved ones off into the afterlife. So these are some things that we will go through. Lastly, before, uh, before I start, inshallah, is that there's a table outside. Um, those who are Muslim representatives, you've got um, some brothers donated, so and stuff like that. Please take it for your Muslims. Um, and there's some uh, bookmarks and all that stuff as well. When you leave, inshallah, please take as much as you can, as you want to. So that inshallah, let's start now. So, um, If you have any questions, if you have any questions, there's a number on our back, it's quite easy, 078 57 58 You can text that number, and then we can, at the end, we'll go through the questions. It's quite easy and it's 50 minutes. If you have any questions, just text it. Don't want to it, text it, please. We'll get the messages here, and at the end, inshallah, we'll go through all the messages. Keep it relevant to the topic, and inshallah, we'll, we'll try and answer the discussion. Um, so, most of us who are here from, from Burnley and Stonewall, we know that our charity community outreach, uh, we started about 10 years ago, and Muslim Burial Trust is a, one of the um, uh, rings of community outreach, is a project that we started about five years ago. And the whole reason was that, uh, as we saw, that people, their expenses of burial was very high. Uh, so we tried to fill that gap up where we said that, no, there's should, there should, there should, an easier way and uh, where a community funded project can take, the people can, don't have to pay extortionate prices for a burial. So Alhamdulillah, we filled that gap. Um, you know, within the last five years, we've probably, we've helped about over about six, seven hundred families, especially during COVID. Um, Alhamdulillah, we, our charity, Muslim Burial Trust, probably did about 260 whistles we, in, in total. So now, Alhamdulillah, we have about four vehicles on fleet, and we covered from, from Chester all the way to, I mean, we covered Burnley Pen and Rosendale, but we also cover Chester, we can do others in Luton and the parts of the UK as well, Derby as well. And we would like to expand more towards throughout the whole of the UK this, alhamdulillah, unique, unique uh, setup we have in Burnley. I mean, I mean, I moved to London about one and a half years ago. Even in London, nobody has this setup where it's a community feeling that everybody, the, the family do not have to worry about anything when a person passes away in their, in their, in their own families. So it's a unique model that we have. We like to expand. But the only way we can expand because it's solely run on volunteers. If we have volunteers, inshallah, we can expand more and more. And this can be a project that can help the whole of UK, inshallah. That's one of our goals, inshallah, that we want to do. So Mr. Very Interest, um, so one of the things that we also do is that, um, so we, we have the full 
the vehicles with the, with the equipment inside it. We also did the paperwork registration. Alhamdulillah, over the last five years, we've gained a lot of trust from the coroner's office, from even Blackman Hospital, Preston Hospital, um, even the registration office, and even the cemetery staff. You know, like yesterday, we buried a sister, um, and we've got a call at the same time that it's going to be a, another person's passed away. So they've already took the grave work, even though before we got the paperwork. Mm -hmm. So this is a very a relationship that we've created between even non-Muslim staff towards a uh, to, uh, trusting Muslim burial trust that much. Um, Alhamdulillah, in 2020, we got the Mayor's Award for our services, as well as we were nominated for the Queen's Award for our services. So this is all, Alhamdulillah, because of the community of Burnley and the brothers, especially Rosendale and Burnley, the brothers working hard in the system as well. Um, we also try to help those brothers and sisters, families who are struggling financially, they cannot afford to pay for the burial. We try to help them as much as possible that way as well. If we have any funds in our pot, we try to so, uh, help that as well. Now, the whole aims and objectives of this uh, workshop, I'm going to try and, um, it's, there's a lot of, um, uh, things to go through, but the relevant things I'll, I'll expand on, the irrelevant things, not irrelevant, but things that are, that are not in that expansion, I will just skip through it uh, very briefly. So the aim and objectives of this workshop is, one, the main thing is to, uh, the, the reminder of Akhirah and the preparation of it. Can everybody see the slides or is it too nice? It's a little bit light blur. Yeah. On top of it's blurry. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's a lot better. That's a lot better. Yeah. I can't control that, sorry. But anyway, um, so the, the main objective of this workshop is one is to remind ourselves that we have to prepare for Akhir. That one day we will also end up that some, someone else will do our muscle for it. Someone else will draw us six foot under the grave, uh, under the ground. This is the main thing. And uh, secondly, also, is that those of us who have elderly parents and elderly relatives, those who are, uh, uh, um, to also understand that how do we make it swift for them and easy for them, and e uh, to, for them to uh, pass from, and they passed away, all the way to burial, how, is, how to make that journey easy for them. This is the main objective of this, of this uh, workshop. Yes, we also learn that what are the laws and what are the different ways of how to, uh, uh, the different, um, avenues that we can utilize in terms of releasing your body and so forth. That's part of it as well. Also is that there's certain customs that we have within our communities, uh, with arts and certain things that we may do, we may be part of, we may have come across as youngsters we've seen elders do, or we may come across that we are, you know, and we see certain things that we may come now to see now that, that this is something new. So certain customs that we can eradicate and we learn from the resources of Islam as well as fiqh, inshallah, that what does Islam say about this? Thirdly, uh, the fiqh of Janazah and, uh, and, and Ghusl, the, that, that, um, the burial arrangements, how do burial is going to take place in this country? What are the requirements? What are the paperwork that is needed? You know, who to contact? We'll go through that as well. Lastly, understand the law regarding burial. So with, with the burial site or with medical site, is, is constantly changing. There's a lot of trial and errors that take place within <coughs> our community, within all of the UK. Um, you know, they, they roll out certain things and it doesn't work, we, we, then we come back to them again, or certain ways, certain paperwork are not electronic and certain, so different things that we are changing. The, so the up-to-date way, shall I be going through that as well, how, um, what, what's the very limited in this country. So the first thing, is that before a person passes away, the what's required, one, what a person is required to prepare a will. The Prophet of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam so mentions regarding that if a person, if a person has even a small amount of wealth, a little bit of wealth, he should not sleep over two nights without writing a will. So it's very important that we all write a will. Now, in this country, yes, the Islamic will is one, but also to recognize the will in this country by law, <coughs> according to the law of this land. So there are different companies, there are different solicitors or even muftis you can go towards and um, gain knowledge from that. You know, locally, I know uh, Abdul Habib Dar, uh, is it Blakewater solicitors? Blakewater solicitors in Blackburn. So they provide that service as well. You can speak to him. He can speak to him. He's quite local for us. There's other solicitors available as well. It's very important, especially, especially you know, 
as you know, also continent uh, families would know that when there's no will after that, the heirs start fighting and there's different matters that happen. But more importantly, I mean, inheritance tax and certain about housing and mortgages and all that stuff, it's very important that it's noted not only according to Islam, but also according to the law of the land, that the will is written. So the importance of a will before a person passes away, it's the stress of Hadith of the Prophet that the person should not sleep before he, you know, whilst he's alive, if he's got even a little bit of wealth, he should write a will. Secondly, also, so the benefits of an Islamic will, yes, after the person passes away, at least the heirs will, will know that who is right is what, what is who's. Then also import, uh, the importance of uh, is will in this country. Like one is the inheritance tax, but also especially for those who are um, uh, even for burials as well. So if uh, I have noticed in the last five years, you know, converts, especially those witnesses or reverts, we had cases where I remember two years ago in Rosendale, uh, there was a sister who passed away in, in, in a home. So her, she was a convert, but in her will she did not write that I uh, want to be buried in a Muslim manner, Muslim, uh, an Islamic, uh, Islamic ritual. So they were going to cremate her, but it took a lot of um, fighting, should we say, to uh, give her rights in, in an Islamic, Islamic manner. So it's very important that all, if we know, if we have friends or family who are, especially reverts, that they don't have an Islamic name or surname, so it's that, that thing pushes in the fact that to write it that will, that my burial should always be in an Islamic or towards a Muslim way. Mm -hmm. uh, lastly, also the procedure of wills that you can consult. Again, it's, I'm not going to go through that, but you can consult Muktis or Imams, you can also consult, like I said, the airport. So there's, there's others around as well. Online, there's many, many uh, companies available that who write Islamic wills according to the law of the Islam as well. And I think the three sources I mentioned. So now, the last moments of a person, which is called EOL or end of life care. The end of life care, where a person, what happens is that where the doctors have said that there is no way of saving that person, or there is, not, there's no return that's going to be saved from this illness, um, you know, cancer, or uh, very late stages of cancer, or a person who is just about to pass away, say, within a few weeks or a few months. Now, end of life care. Um, can be provided at some times at home. The doctor will say take the patient home and that can be provided at home. A lot of people choose the hospice. You know, locally we have mental health and inside hospice. But there are a lot of hospices around which 24 hour care is given by nurses and doctors. But there's also something called end of life drugs that sometimes doctors prescribe. Now, the thing to understand is there is a debate between uh, scholars that is this allowed to take or not? Some scholars say no, because this is like saying that if you take that drug, you are committing suicide or you are ending your life. But others say no, it's not, because this, the end of life drug, I, I asked this to Dr. Alamin, and he mentioned that he said that end of life drug does not um, end person, a person's life, it eases the pain towards the end. I mean, it's from the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's like, like when we have a headache, you take a paracetamol, you take a painkiller. So it eases the pain. Yes, it's from the will of Allah. So end of life drugs is a similar thing. But it's a, it's a choice of the family. It's, it's a choice of the family that if they want to, uh, or the loved ones, the next of kin, that those uh, who are on end of life, that they should they want to give end of life drugs or not, that's up to them. It's a choice of the family. So. Both sides, are, I'm not going to say correct or false, but it's, it's entirely up to the choice of the next of kin and the family that if they want to give the patient that or not. Secondly also, when a person is just about to pass away, uh, that person is not a muhtada, about just the, the pangs of death have started. So say even where the, the, what, the saharat or the, where death had already started, we say, from the, floor, from the bottom of the body, it's going up. That's the time of Muhtada where there is no way of turning back life again. Where even, for example, some of the scholars have said that they have seen the afterlife as well, the, the angel of death have been seen. So that's now a Muhtada is that person. Now, what to pray around the Muhtada? There are many Muslim du'as. Yes, uh, when a person is dying, you should do which is that a person should uh, should recite the kalimah Taiba la ilaha illallah. You should not force anybody to pray that. Those who are around, pray that together, and then that just to encourage them, encourage them. 
and other things you can pray this is Surah and Surah Yaseen and so forth, many of the uh, Quranic verses we can pray. But there are many Muslim du'as, but the most advised thing is the, to <coughs> petition of the Kalima Tayyibah as much as possible. But do not ever, do not ever order the person, the patient, to recite, to say this. Because at a time of death, um, the brains are not working yet. It's the, the, the thought process is not the same. So they might retaliate in a bad way, so no, I'm not going to pray that. So that's why we, it's advisable that those who are around, those who are around, and if you have the right people around, sometimes the wrong people around, they start screaming, they start crying, wailing, and then it, it's, it, it's, it, it becomes very difficult for the person who is going to pass away. Um, so that's the stage of safarat, where a person is just from going from this world to the hereafter, the stages of the last stage of, of, of this world, that's called safarat. Um, so after a person dies, after a person passes away, um, depending on how they are, so it, every single patient should be different. So every single patient should be different. So if a person has passed away at home, say for example, so uh, a normal person, so it is advisable that we close their jaws, close their mouth, tie a, a piece of cloth around, also close their eyes, uh, the, the fingers and their feet, the legs should be stretched. Because if that's not done, after a few hours, we can notice happens where the the bones that are the, the, the limbs that are kept like that, it becomes stiff like that. So if, if the arms are not moved and it's kept like that, what will happen? It's impossible to move afterwards. That that takes quite a few long few hours, but it's best to do that as soon as possible. So we even say that to tie the foot to the feet together and, uh, and and stretch the leg. Yes, it is also advisable to face it towards the fibula if that is possible with a pillow. But again, there's two things, two aspects. I always say to our volunteers is that whenever you get involved in funeral, there's just two things. One is the respect of the deceased and the patient, and two is the safety of yourself. So if you cannot lift that person, or if it's going to be causing disrespect to that, the deceased or the patient, then do not do that. If it's going to cause more pain to that person, then do not do that. If a person is paralyzed or his arms are, all, you know, or his legs cannot be stretched straight and straightened, then we should not pull it to say that, no, let's straighten it. That that's going to cause disrespect to the deceased or the patient. Secondly, the same, same with our individual volunteers. If it's going to be difficult for two people to lift the body, get six people to lift the body. So always think about the safety of yourself as well as the respect of the patient and the disease. Um, so again, the dua is the first thing we recite when a person has breathed his last, in the and there's other du'as, the Muslim du'as that we can also recite. So that's the last moments of the person. Now, after this, now the person passed away, what are the necessary preparations that we should do? The first thing, there's four scenarios in this country. A person can pass away in four different ways. Oh, there's many other ways, but these are four most common. The first one is that a person passes away at home. Secondly, a person passes away at the hospital. And then at home, a person passes away, you know, a child, all of a sudden passes away. Without a medical, you know, there's no history behind it. Sudden death. But at home also, he passes away, for, for example, he's got a long term illness, like cancer. So the doctors have said that you can take him home, six months, he's got three months or two months left, take him home, he passes away home. And a person who passes away the hospital, same again, he has a long term medical history and someone who's gone, gone for an eye check and he passed away at home. So no medical history at all. So all these two scenarios we just split into four have different ways. So a person who passes away at home, the two, the first one, with no medical history. <coughs> Most likely, 99.9%, the police will be involved and it will be considered as a suspicious death, like a murder. So until the coroner's office and the police do not do the investigations, we cannot bury the body. So where people say to us that, you know, when is the Janazah going to be, or when is the burial going to be? It's not, a lot of, when a person passes away in this country, a lot of things is not in the hands of our communities and our Muslims and our funeral services. It's in the hands of the authorities. So the police will be involved, they will come to the house, they will interview the, the household, and they will determine that it's a, it's a suspicious death or not. If the police say it's a suspicious death, then it will be referred to the coroner's office, and the coroner will do an inquest, which is a inquiry. You can say an investigation for an inquest. But that can take two days, three days, five days, seven days, that's up to them. But most of the time, we, alhamdulillah, in UK, we are very lucky that the Muslim community have worked very hard, but within three days or two, three days, they usually, usually give the body. 
And then the inquest, once they've done the examining, they can, the inquest can last for six months, one year, that, that's up to them. That's the paper of the day. So the family will have to appear at the courts, and it's the normal that they will, that they will say that, why did this person pass away? What's our investigation what we have found? So it'd be like a normal court. But that, nobody else knows about it. Okay? That's that if a person passes away at home, suspiciously, without any medical uh, history. But if a person has a medical history, like he's been sent home for because due to cancer or an <coughs> illness, then that's quite simple. The police don't get involved. So usually the last, per, last doctor, last GP or the consultant who has seen that person, they, offer, they issue a death certificate and then the burial arrangements takes place quite easily. In the first scenario where the police are involved, most of the time, most of the time, the body is taken to the morgue, which our local morgue is in Blackwell, Blackwell Hospital. But in the second scenario where a person has got a long-term illness and a person, uh, the doctors know about it, so then that person, that deceased person, can be taken to the local masjids. So sometimes we keep it in the masjid, and then when the, on the following, if a person passes away at night time, the funeral service is allowed to keep the, the body in the masjid or whatever, whatever, whichever place we have. Then that, after the following day or following morning, sorry, uh, the GP or the consultant will issue that certificate. So that's quite straightforward. At hospital, if a person passes away at hospital, now, uh, the last time we checked was within 24 hours. Now that might, they were changing at the 12 hours. If a patient was in the hospital within less than 24 hours, then it will be considered a suspicious death. If the patient was in the hospital more than 24 hours, it will be considered as a normal death. And they will do an inquiry on how, why he died, and they will issue. If it's a suspicious death, less than 24 hours, the doctor, if it's less than 24 hours, if it's less than 24 hours, it will go back to the coroner's office, it will be an inquest, Cycle is a safe thing. Again, all these slides, uh, all this, what I'm saying is that it's quite a simple slide that I've sent out to some of the brothers here. Inshallah, we will get it from us as well. Now, those are the four scenarios. So every scenario has a different outcome. But at the end of it all, it's either referred to the coroner's office or it's either referred to, not, not referred to the coroner. But now, since um, about three, four years now, or four years, it's piloted out just before COVID. Coventry and certain other cities and towns, a medical examiner. Now the coroner, most of them are retired from uh, backgrounds of law. They are like retired judges or retired solicitors. Or like our coroner, local coroner, he was a solicitor for like 50 years, so now he's a coroner. They they go from the law side. So what they did was that what was happening before, if you notice, if you remember about 10 years ago, that it used to take like two, three days sometimes to get paperwork, or sometimes we used to get paperwork back four in the afternoon just before the uh, couple of stand closes. But now what's happened in the last three, four years is we've got something called a medical examiner. So a medical examiner he is um, the base in the hospital. So we have one a medical examiner in Blackburn Hospital. So he is a consultant, a senior consultant within the hospital, and they have a group of consultants within the hospital. So alhamdulillah we have a lot of Muslim brothers who are doctors, sisters who are doctors, part of this group. That's why you know when you, if a death happens in Blackburn, it's quite swiftly but they are put good relationship with the Muslim doctor to get certificates quite easily. So when a death happens, it goes to the medical examiner first. Now if the medical examiner is happy with the report, with the, the report the GP gives or the consultant gives, if he is happy, then it doesn't got it doesn't get referred to Preston, i.e. the coroner's office. But if he's not happy, he'll say no, it's referred to the coroner's office. Then the cycle goes more and more. So the medical examiner is a blessing for us, where 90 percent of the time now it's referred to the medical examiner, and then the registration happens in the burial lab. It's quite easy. Yeah? I'm just telling you this, so when it, if, if a death does happen in our family, then at least we know that why there may be a delay. If you, are, if you get involved in, in, our, in our services, volunteers, as volunteers, it's good to know this. So, medical examiner, we don't, we, you don't have, you know, as volunteers, we don't have connection with the board. Alhamdulillah, we have a brother, Brother Imran Patel, a very good relationship with him, and he sits on the board. So if we have an issue, we call him, so he, he usually sorts it out. Sorts it out, sorts it out like that. So a um, medical examiner, he's in the middle, he's a consultant with the Black Hospital, and that can change. So I think throughout the whole of UK, now they've, they've, this has been successful from the NHS, and they've rolled it out throughout the whole of UK. It was piloted out about four years ago, and then Blackburn also piloted about two years ago, during COVID time, and now <coughs> we've got a permanent medical examiner within Blackburn Hospital. So once it's referred to the medical examiner, uh, or the coroner's office, 
the, the coroner's office will determine has any laws been broken. So they will refer it to the, as a post mortem first, or you know, what we know as a CT scan. You know, 97% um, when we had it uh, five years back, we had a funeral awareness course that we started by about 75, six years ago. And we had a pathologist, yeah, Alhamdulillah, is an Egyptian brother, an Egyptian doctor, our local pathologist, the person that puts up uh, just the uh, post mortem. Uh, in Blackburn, in our East Lancashire, is a Muslim. So he told us that 97%, so 7 out of 10 bodies, uh, will go through a digital scan more than a full post mortem. So what will happen? So, so the body will go through a digital scan or a CT scan, and then the results will come back to the coroner's office. If the coroner is happy with that, he will release the body and he'll say he can bury the body. If he's not happy, then he'll say it's a full post mortem where the person is. And they, they find out what has happened. Now, some of the, I mean, when, a lot of times when I do these workshops, some of the brothers ask that in our wills or in our, can we write the fact that I don't want a post mortem? We can't do that. In this country, we cannot write that I don't want a post mortem. It it's all depends upon the coroner's decision. So, most of the time is a CT scan, digital post mortem. Sometimes it's a full post mortem, full post mortem. And, and then the inquest happened with the inquiry from the coroner's office. After that, once that has happened, then we register the body, the registration office, so ours is traveling abroad. Um, but whatever the body passes away, whatever the, sorry, the patient passes away, if it's in Burnley, our local one is traveling abroad. If it's in Blackburn, we register in Blackburn. If the person passes away in Preston, you have to register the body, the, the disease, whatever, whichever town or city they have passed away. Then only after that, only after that, we can book in the cemetery uh, a burial spot. So it's all these stages, or three stages, we have to go through before we can make a phone call to the Burnley Cemetery to say that can we book uh, uh, for a burial. A lot of time, you know, in, in, in Burnley or wherever we are, we think that the burial site is the main thing. The burial site is the last thing that you have to think about. The burial site, the burial can be delayed, it's the matter if it's the next day. But it's the paperwork that takes the most toll, and that is the hardest thing to get. So, uh, if we cannot book, yes, in Burnley, we have a relationship, but we pencil in that if we have to have a burial, we say that if you had a death, pencil in a burial for it. Because you have to understand, in, for example, Burnley, the cemetery staff, they work, they look after about five cemeteries, four or five cemeteries, dependent about five, six cemeteries, Corn, Nelson, and other areas. So, these cemetery staff, they, they do Muslims, they're not Muslims. So you, they have to have time for bookings. So if the booking of that time is the last thing we think about, um, but it is the last thing from the, from the whole preparations of burying a person. Now what are the legal process? The, the first thing that we ask, has the cause of death been determined and medical certificate issued? So that's the first thing. So if that's a yes or a the GP, the GP will <coughs> ask you a death certificate. Now on this note I mentioned to you as well, is that those Youngsters who have elderly parents or elders within their families, please, 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 you know, and the, one of the last slides that I have is that there's four five check things that we should always do. We go to a lot of you know, uh, diseases, uh, homes, and youngsters do not know what their father's GP's name is. So is this a simple thing that you should know? GP's name, medical history, even the date of birth, and stuff like that, you should know. Because it's, it's the, the, the process smoothens a lot. So, when a person passes away, the first thing the GP will do is give a cause of death, MCC. Inshallah, one of the pictures on the slide will come there, a picture of the certificate. Or the, the consultant from the hospital will give that. Now, if a person has passed away at home, and they are an end of life care, like they're very ill right towards the end, well, a district nurse comes to visit that patient every day when we saw them give medication and so forth. The district nurse can also issue a certificate, but that is not the death certificate the registration office will accept. So she will say that, she, she or he will say, the district nurse will say that this person has died. That's it. But the following day, the GP or the consultant has to issue the fact that this person has died because of this. So the first part, if the district nurse issues that, that is not accepted by the registration office. But what, what that determines 
is that we can carry on doing the ghusl and the janazah namaz. But if the district nurse is not involved and it, we wait for the GP, we cannot touch the body. Like we should be advised not to give ghusl, we are advised not to put the coffin on. Sometimes we've done that because of that, but then we have to take the coffin off. And because they have to, they have to go through a CT scan and all that process. Again. So the first thing is that has the cause of death been determined by the district nurse, the consultant, or the GP? If yes, what the easy thing to do is contact the registrar's office, registration office, obtain death certificate and certificate of disposal. Again, these two certificates will come in the following slides. Now, the registration office through COVID it has changed a bit. You know, before you have to physically go to the registration office um, and get, get a certificate printed and then go to the cemetery and show that. Now, again, we have to physically go. So, the family next of kin have to physically go to the registration office with. ID and so forth, and register the death. But digitally, these certificates are sent automatically to um, automatically to the registration office. Sorry, to the cemetery and to us to the burial to, to the funeral services. So before you used to get printed ones. You get printed ones as well, but digitally it's sent. So now what's up there is it is the, the the process where you don't have to physically go to the cemetery to give the certificate. It's, it's still in some registra registration offices. You don't physically have to go to the registration office. They give you a phone call, you just have to confirm everything, and they just process the certificates. It makes it much easier in digital life. But after that, then only contact the secretary office to arrange your grave, submit the green certificate. Again, these certificates and the pictures will come in the next slide. But if the cause of death has not been issued, then what will happen then? So the death will be reported to the coroner's office. No action can be taken until clearance from the coroner's office. Now, same thing about the CT scan. And the CT scan offered by the NHS is usually done in black hospitals sometimes, but most of the time it's in Preston Hospital. And they only have, I think, two machines or something. I think uh, a couple of years ago, one of the masters in Preston donated one as well. So they're very, very few, uh, they're, they're million pound machines. But those CT scans are used for everything from determining hearts and brain surgery and everything. So it's a process the NHS have to go through because of the patients, the different types of patients they have. Now, a death is not considered as an urgency compared to a person who's going through a very brain surgery. There may be a delay. But there is an option of a private CT scan. We've had uh, families where they want to smoothen the process more. And we've taken them to Manchester in Salford. There's a hospital. I think so. Last time we did it about five, four or five years ago, it was about 700 pounds. So you pay about 700 pounds privately and you can get the CT scan. And they would send the results to the coroner's office and automatically that the process happens again. But if it's through the NHS, which is either Blackburn Hospital or Preston Hospital for us, then that can, there can be a delay because of patients and other types of medical issues. Now, if we cannot do anything until the clearance from the coroner's office. Lastly, also, the, so, so the coroner will inform the coroner will inform the, registr of the registration office with the certificate can be obtained. So what will happen now? So then you don't need a doctor, you don't need to go back to the doctors again. So the coroner's office will automatically email us the, yes, that's been processed, the funeral service, as well as the, the cemetery, also the registration office. And then the, the, you register the death, and the process is the same again, uh, the, the burial takes place. So this is a simple legal process of a person who passes away in this country towards the yes and no, if the certificates have been uh, obtained or not. Now, this is the very issue. Once the GP or the ME's office, the medical examiner or the consultant has issued a medical certificate and the coroners have given a, a burial order. So make an appointment with the registry. You don't need to do that today, in, in, in now, nowadays. Uh, they automatically give an appointment to anyway. um, Again, secondly, also collect the disease from the mortuary. Now, if, if it's in the, if our local hospital, is Preston, majority of them, Majority of the disease are kept in the morgue in Blackburn Hospital, but sometimes in Preston, sometimes Blackpool, sometimes even Keithley. We um, complete the cemetery forms and pay the fees. Now in Burnley, Burnley, it's a very simple form. I mean, usually most of the time we fill it, we give most of the details. So most of the very interest we have on our events, when we get a form, form, we have a digital form. Uh, we give out to the next of kin and they fill it in. So from the, the the contact details to the coffin size to which mustard they will have the uh, the in, how many volunteers they have for us. So there's a, about two sides, two equal sides 
they fill in, and we have all the details. So we have put in a spreadsheet, and then that detail, the details are shared with the cemetery staff. So then, it, this process is much easier then. But in, say for example, in Pendle in Nelson, they have to, you have to fill in an extra form. Yeah? You have to fill an extra form in before you get a burial site, which um, has to be done before we can book a, 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 a burial plot. And again, we usually fill that in with the signature of the next of kin. Blackburn is quite is similar to Blackburn again. Yeah. But in terms of the fees, so in Nelson, they usually give 28 working days. They send us, uh, it must be very interesting, an invoice, and then we just send the invoice to the family and they pay that off. In Blackburn, if they, about, within about a week or so, seven, days, seven to ten days, seven to ten days they send. In Blackburn, you have to prepay. You have to pay that beforehand. So physically, you have to go down or over the phone, you have to pay for the seven the burial spot, and then they will give, confirm that. Now, on this note as well, Burnley Cemetery now charges about £2,600, plus or minus that much. In Nelson, if you are a non pendant resident, so if you're a pendant resident, it's one price, but if you're a non pendant resident, it's um, £900 more, I think eight or £900 more they charge. This has been happening for the last eight, eight to ten months, about a year or so. In Blackburn, same thing. So if you're a you're right. If you're a non Blackburn resident, so if you're a Blackburn resident, then the fees is uh, it's about 2,500, 2,400. But if you're a non Blackburn resident, what happens is that they put the fees so there's an extra pay for about seven, eight hundred pounds. So that the reason why they look at the council have done that is that because the resident they want the residents to have a priority areas in those sites. But alhamdulillah in Burnley we have a beautiful cemetery site, the cemetery now, very flat, very, you know, it's, it's a nice plot that we have. Again, you know, a lot of the burials that we are having in the deceased in Burnley are very, very the loved ones, uh, the family are very the loved ones within Burnley Cemetery now. And Burnley Cemetery now, again, you know, yesterday when we went, about two, three rows left and we need a new plot again now, because this is being full as well. So then after that, uh, Ari, as inquired by the Ari family with the masjid and Manikur, so for the Janaza and the Osir. And the last thing, buried at the cemetery of the choice by the burying family. So again, we cover uh, Rosendale, uh, Hazelden, as well as Rotterstone, or uh, Blackbird, for instance, one in Preston. And so we cover all this, this part of Lancashire, shall we say. Now, these are the certificates that we, we went through. So the first one, MCCD, so MCCD, Medical Certificate of Cause of Death. Okay? This is issued by the consultant, hospital consultant, or, your, or the GP. This is to determine the reason why they the death happened. And then the second one, the certificate of the fact of it, this is an injury. So in um, the coroner's office may issue this, but this is more than enough. Most of the time, <laughs> the MCCD is the certificate the family will get, will be taken towards to the registration office. And then the registration office will give these two certificates. One is the death certificate. Now this costs, I think, about £12 a copy. Now, it's a hard copy they will give. They usually give one copy so you pay for it. But if, per, if a deceased has mortgages or even uh, pension plans and all this stuff, you have to cancel it. So, so most of the time, these companies ask for a, a hard copy um, a, of, a, of this death certificate. They, they don't accept digital copies or they don't accept court copies as well. So it's, it might be an idea to gain, to gain two, three copies if required. But there are companies out there now where you send them the, co the copy of the certificate and they will contact in each and every avenue to uh, cancel all these things, or mortgages and so forth. But the second one that is important that we need, which is called the green, sorry, it's known as the green, now, uh, which is called the certificate of disposal and it's a green colour. This certificate is required to collect the body from the morgue so the hospital will not release the body until this certificate is given. And the, host, the, the burial site will not book a, a burial spot, a grave, until this certificate is given. Because every single certificate at this top corner is looked up here, has a number. So every person is given a digit, four digit number, every deceased person. So that deceased person's number has to be recorded in the hospital, like the hospital has released that number. And then that, that same number is recorded in, in the cemetery that that person has been buried in this plot. 
So that, that's kept on complete record, the fact that this person has, been, has died. So he, from, from the registration all the way to the hospital till the burial, the same number, the code is stored to say that this, this process happened legally. We have had mistakes from the hospital where <coughs> one incident has happened to us where they released the wrong body to us and we nearly buried that sister and then luckily, luckily, so alhamdulillah, uh, just before the burial, some, someone recognized the mistake and they had to take the body back and we got another body, the right body and it was sad because it was a Reba sister, it was a Reba sister that was supposed to be washed and this was during Covid. So it's very important. So now in Blackburn there was a, uh, see this is, this is not come out to the public, but in Blackburn Hospital, I think we, about two, three months we spent with meetings with them that well, how they made this mistake. So now they have a process that we have to fill a form in to say that the, the more mortuary staff have to sign off the form to say that they've given the right body. It, 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 it happens in many, many towns and cities, but it's happened to us as well once. So it's quite advisable that we take a family member, you know, Luckily, that time they were, you know, very sad that it was a river system. She had no family, so we had to collect the body. So brothers had to go collect the body, and then, you know, the sister that gave the husband, they didn't know who she was. So that it happened like that. But alhamdulillah, because of the age or the gaps that showed of the diseases and the paperwork, it didn't quite match. So we called the cemetery and they, no, sorry, the mortuary and they found. They see they made a mistake. So they came and collected the body and gave them the right, the right person. And they, you know, we were just about to bury the body. It was like that. Fair anyway. So these are the two certificates that the registration office gives. But after the green has been given, then the burial site will be booked. Now near the deceased, so a person has passed away now, and um, so which people are allowed to be around the deceased? So before the us, before the us, you know, usually when the person is about you know, the last day on Sahara, uh, people are praying Quran and the adhkar and so forth. But when a person has passed away, <coughs> advisable in the same room, Quran should not be prayed. In the adjacent room, in the next room, that is allowed to pray. Until the person has been given ghusl. Some of the scholars have also said that in terms of a woman on her monthly period, is not also allowed to be present within that room where the person is, um, the, the deceased person is. But this is a debatable thing, especially during COVID. We had a lot of issues because the families that had, had not seen their loved ones for three, four months. So we did ask, we consulted with many scholars around here. Yeah. There was there is certain leeways we have to allow because they wouldn't have seen that family member at all then. Because we were burying people where we, we collected in the morning within three hours. So they hadn't seen them for like six, seven, three, four weeks or four, five month, months in the hospital they've been in. So there is debatable in both sides, but it's advisable that a woman on the month's period should not be present within where the disease is. Now, but after the person has been given ghusl, then Quran is allowed to be recited. Yes, the kid is allowed, that's fine. But the Quranic recitation within that same group, it should be advised not to do that. <coughs> now, touching the disease. Now, again, some, some, some say that you know, we shouldn't do that, but it is allowed. Abu Bakr the Allah, the Prophet of Allah passed away, and he came and he came and kissed the Prophet of Allah, the Prophet of Allah, the Prophet of Allah, the passed away, and he may kiss him also. So, it is allowed to touch, you are allowed to touch the disease. Well, now, now, this is one thing within our, our subcontinent that we have. That our next door auntie, we call Khala all our lives, she's our real Khala. It doesn't work like that. Okay? So whatever you know, fiqh that we have within when, you, when the person is alive, the person who is allowed to be mahram or non mahram, also is the same thing when a person passed away. So it doesn't matter if they are only 16, 17, or 20 years old, and, and then the auntie who is about 80 years old, oh, it, 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 this is my, my son. No, if it's not allowed, it's not allowed. It's very important this we, we recognize this. Um, in the mortuary, now the mortuary is, um, like I said, it's in black. Um, when you go to the mortuary, um, it's, 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 it is a quite distressing place to order. A lot of brothers who we take, they, they, they don't um, have the heart to, should we say, collect bodies. And, um, they do, you know, you take, you take two people, to collect the body, you come back with two bodies because one person cannot take it. But it's, it is hard, it is difficult, but it's very important for the youngsters, especially, to get involved with this because so they recognize what life is about, what real life is about. So, when you go to the mortuary, um, the very nice staff, there's about three staff there, um, and very helpful as well. So, um, in the mortuary, it's, it's not a clean place, so in terms of recitation, 
recycling the motoring. So it's, it's not advisable to do that in the motoring. Now, now we come to the part of washing and showering the bodies. Um, now, where to keep the disease? So we mentioned this before that if a person, most of the time, it's kept in the morgue, but sometimes also we can keep the body within the vessels. In Berlin, we have uh, our so what we try to do to keep the costs for the mustards low. You know, a lot of mustards ask, ask us and, and tell us for advice, ask us for advice to, to fit in a, a, a fridge or a refrigeration system for the body. But I, I also say no, because they cost about a thousand pounds to two thousand pounds. But you're going to use it. In Burnley, we have about, you know, annually we have about twelve to thirteen deaths a year, and every single person in Hamdulillah has a hostel a year. But having a, a facility where it is only utilized for two, twice, three times a week, uh, once a year, sorry, it's not feasible. You know, I, I, I'm an imam in London. We have about two thousand people for Jummah. We don't have a hostel facility. We have 2,000 people for Jum'ah, we have 600 students in our maktab, we don't have a facility. In the whole of East London, there's only three masjids, or four masjids I know, that have a Muslim facility. And in New York, where I come, we have 55 masjids. 55 masjids we have in one area. So in the whole of East London, there's probably about 700 masjids. 700 masjids, and we only have four Muslim facilities. And every day there's about 15 deaths. And how that works, it's a community thing. In Oldham, in Oldham, there's only two Muslim areas. In the whole of Oldham, there's two masjids that are Muslim, or three masjids now. Masjid Islam has one now. Three masjids have Muslim facilities. Why? Because it's not required. It's not required. But when we utilize as a community, you know, in COVID time, in Burnley, we only utilize Queen's Gate. We need over 200 Muslims in Queen's Gate masjid. None of the other masjids were used. I'm not against the fact that the masjid should not have the facility. But I'm a, I am on the advocate of the fact that that money should be utilized in the right manner. So, same thing here with the fridge. It's only going to be used maximum twice or three times a year. Maximum two, three times a year. Twice a year. Now, in twice a year, if you're going to spend a thousand pounds, it's not feasible to do that. So what we have, what we said, we, we've got a foldable cool, cool team that is transportable to any masjid, to any home as well. And you can just put it in a car boot. We've got two. Um, you can take it anywhere. Anyway. So that, it, 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 it solves a lot of problems. So that way, none of the masjid had that strain of keeping the body. So if the body wants to be kept at home, you can keep it at home. If you want to keep it in the masjid, by all means, that's fine. So, where to keep the disease, it can be kept in the masjid, at home, whatever it is. But if, like we mentioned in the previous slide, if the district nurse has issued a death certificate, where she, she or he has just written, the nurse has written, the fact that a death has occurred, then that body has to be stored in a public place like the masjid. Or the more. But if the GP has given it, or the hospital has issued it, then by you can do the wasal and so forth, and you can take it home or whichever one you can store it. Um, then the wasal process happens, and when you're preparing the shroud, so that is. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll go through this two, three things after. But, so these, the wasal and the shrouding, we do a practical, instead of me going through every single process. But, like I said, the slides that I've shared with some of the brothers, that has all the process in, in text form. But we'll go through the practical, inshallah. So why do I finish off the, the, rest, the rest of the parts, and then we'll do the practical as the end, end yeah? Now, I memorize it to here. Straight now. <laughs> I'm just going to skip a bit, that's right. Yeah. Or just had a post mortem, 
then raising the head and the body to clear the waste could cause more, more harm than anything else. So especially when post-mortem, uh, especially during COVID where there was a lot of cuts, uh, uh, cuts and bruises that have been, you know, were happening on, on, on deceased bodies, just uh, where when it comes to uh, clearing up the, uh, the, the stomach, it's, it's not advisable, especially for a woman who's given childbirth or gone through a severe operation, then it's not advisable to do that because you can put some bruises open up again. Now, camphor is used, uh, camphor, which is kafu, or some of call it mothballs, yeah, we'll go through that, inshallah, is utilized. Um, the reason why is that it, it keeps, you know, when, when the body is lowered into the grave, it keeps uh, the body more intact. Uh, we, you know, it keeps it more pressure, is it, on the insects and, uh, and these things for longer. It is recommended that the ghusl, those who perform the ghusl, that they should take a bath after the ghusl. And lastly, there is no Islamic teaching of reading the Quran or making any special dhikr during the There's no, you know, some people want to play a tape or recitation of Quran or something. There are, you, you, you can do your own, but there's no specific things to do in that sense. Now, this is, um, now the next thing is about stillborn and stillbirth. I'm not going to go through that. Usually when there's sisters, I go through that more. But the, the tables that we have um, uh, on the slides, that it is, it's already there. So the, the process is that fact that, um, in, in that we explained where there is a, a coffin needed and where there is a denaza needed, why if you have to name the child, it's, it's all quite simply explained. But the only thing I will mention is that if a child dies in, uh, within the UK, firstly, is that there are two types of grave. One is a communal grave and one is a private grave. So a communal grave is where fetuses and stillborn and stillbirth or miscarriages, those types of babies or children or fetuses. As a, there's a massive grave, they just stick that and they just put all the bodies in there. On that, there is no, there's one in Burnley, every single cemetery has it. Ours one is toward the top end of the cemetery. Um, so it's a, it's, it's a pit, as you can say, there's, there's put more and more of fetuses in there. That's how they dispose of fetuses. Or those, those babies who, who have died, they're, they're not collected from the hospital by any family members, to the communal grave. So on a communal grave, Islamically it's fine. Islamically, the burial is good. But the thing is, you cannot put a plaque or a name tag or anything there to pay respect for the, uh, for the child, shall I say, or family members to mourn over. But then they, they can have a, uh, the families have a choice of having a half grave or a normal hybrid grave. Where we see, you know, normally when they dig a grave, it's about six foot long. But a half grave, it's about I don't know, one, foot, one and a half foot to two foot. But that costs about three hundred pounds. We didn't burn it. But I know, I think it's been about a year or so now. Year or so now. The UDP, um, the, they have a service where any child who died on the day of eighteen, you can claim that money back and you pay them. So there's a process towards it where uh, parents are on certain benefits and certain. But on the day of eighteen, it is covered by. Covered. Uh, if a child dies, it's covered then. So even if it's a private grave, that's also covered. It's, a, it's entirely the choice of the family. Sometimes the family don't want to go through that process again of hurt, so they do a communal grave. Sometimes they want to carry on paying that respect of that child that has passed away, or that unborn child, stillborn, stillbirth child who passed away. They want to carry on paying that respect, so they, they do a, a private grave. Um, again, uh, so the, the, that's the stillborn and stillbirth and pregnancy loss. These tables are on, on the slides quite detail. Um, this, inshallah, we'll go through in practical way in terms of the process of the ghusl, and how to place the body and so forth. Uh, and the coffin is going to go through as well. This is that stillborn part, I'm going to go through that. So after the ghusl has been done, it's a janazah prayer, janazah salah, okay? So the, now face the qibla with the intention of performing janazah salah. Now janazah salah is not a salah, it's a dua. It's a prayer. And it's, not a, it's not literally a salah, but we call it a salah, it's a prayer. There is no rukum of such a dua of 60 meters in the janazah salah. So the, the process of janazah salah, as we know, uh, there's four takbeers, um, and then you, the, the first takbeer, you pray tana, then salawat, then dua, and then finish with salah. Um, this is the positioning of the janazah salah. Um, 
comes to a, a female and the other uh, adult female, the imam should stand in the middle uh, of the congregation. And when it comes to a, 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 a male boy or, a, or a, a man, then the imam should stand on the head side. It's, this is advisable, basically. Uh, so, Qibla, uh, this is advisable that way. Um, in terms of the rose as well, there's also uh, that it should be a odd number of rows, so to say that it's advisable again. It's not necessary, it's advisable. Um, this is now, now the, the burial part. I'm, I'm, I've skipped through the, the process of the of, of, Janaz, uh, of the Ghusl, because inshallah we practically do that and we'll explain that on the way. Now, how to carry the body? When it comes to after, so now there's two types of burial that we do in this country, which is one is Coffin burial, where a disease is put into the coffin and the coffin is buried within the ground. Another type of burial is shroud burial, without the coffin, just the shroud. Now, this is a misconception. A lot of people uh, families think that we are not allowed to do shroud burials in Burnley. Shroud burial is allowed in Burnley. Uh, and Alhamdulillah, now we are be on the process of working with uh, the Burnley Cemetery on changing the way the grain is dug for shroud burials. So, inshallah, where it will be like where the fact that the body will be fully towards the Qibla, it will be more easier. Mm -hmm. So, inshallah, alhamd, inshallah it, it, it will pass soon, but it, it, it takes a bit of time. So, the planning is still in the planning. So, now they, when they dig a grave, it's just straight down. So, we're trying to say that they'll put a ledge on it, so the body is already tilted up, so we don't have to put any stones or any, any soil at the bottom. So, we, we've submitted the plans, inshallah, it will come through soon, inshallah. inshallah. But um, that, it takes a lot of effort, a lot of effort to do that. So, uh, when it comes to carrying the body, so we have, um, there is a stretcher here, you know, let me show you, it's yellow, it's called a uh, snoop. So, you know, those who are football, when a, a player gets injured, they put, put them on a, on a stretcher. That's called a snoop. The, the reason why it's called a snoop is because on the board side, it comes off, it comes off the stretcher, it comes off. Uh, so we use that on the, when it to collect the body, uh, shall I will show you from there. And the reason, uh, there's two reasons why we do that. One is, when it comes to shower burials, there's handle there, then you don't have to twitch the body so you can pick the body quite easily. But when it comes to volunteers going to pick the body, usually it's males. So when it's a female deceased, we don't have to twitch the body because it's handled. So when we pick the body from there to the whistle table, we put it to the whistle table, both sides is clips, you want to screw that and the, the, the whole thing comes apart. So hurry the body, yes, so we say that we should hurry on the shoulders, but as, if it's a coffin, again, I mentioned there's two things you always remember that the respect of the disease and the safety of the volunteers. We should not break your back. Yeah. If it takes eight people, ten people to carry the body, it doesn't matter. So advice, yes, that we you can put it on the shoulders, so say that we carry it. But most of the time with coffee, it's quite heavy. So we just usually hold it at the bottom, um, four or five people, so four on each side, you just hold the coffee on each side to carry the body. Um, a very good process. What happens now is that so after the ghusl, we put the body inside the, uh, the vehicle and we take it to the cemetery. In the cemetery, if it's a coffin burial, coffin burial, it's quite simple. That we put the the, the, the ropes inside the coffin, the handles of the coffin, and we roll the coffin. And inshallah, the, the, uh, I'll explain the different types of uh, graves that we have. So then we roll the body and we fill the grave. So if it's a sharp burial, if it's a shroud, if it's a male figure, if it's a male, a man, then the shroud burial usually we take on the stretcher. So we have a silver stretcher, a metal one, so that we can wash down quite easily. So we take on the stretcher and we lower it in line with the grave, and there's three brothers that go inside the grave and three who pass the body on. Or depending on how heavy the body is, that's how many people will pass the body on. If it's a female, if it's a female, then it has to be only those who are family members. And then we try, we cover the body, we try to cover it with those who are not family, we cover the body with a top uh, or something uh, opaque which the body cannot be seen, and then we lower the body after they put the wood on top, and then, we, then everybody else joins in to the soil. It's very important, again, respect of the disease, respect of the disease. Uh, on that note as well, about burial process, in Burnley, in Burnley we don't have to take any more. So yeah, spades or ropes, anything we don't have to take, they provide everything. In Blackburn, if you, if you have volunteers or if you have family members, we all, always have to take spades as well. They don't provide spades or they don't provide the ropes to lower the, lower the, uh, the coffin. 
It's not that because they've had incidents where people have left spades inside the grave. So that's why they've stopped it totally. Um, in, Bla in Nelson, again, you don't have to take anything. Yeah? But um, in Blackburn, where we some people get, uh, family members get buried, you have to take both the spade as well as the, the, the two lower the coffin. In Burnley, you don't have to take anything. They provide everything for us. The du'as during burial, again, there are many Muslim du'as that you go through, but there is nothing necessary for the easiest thing to recite is the Kalima Tayyibah and Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. There's other, many du'as that you can recite. But these are some simple things that you can do every day. The main thing to do is always remember about death and try to do as much as Isa as well to, from the deceased as much as possible and to du'a for them. Now, sprinkling water and planting it right under the grave, that's also, a, it's fine, but it, again, in, in this country, I mean, I, I've, I've been to, like, for example, Blackburn, they do that to mold the grave quite easy. But in Burnley, for example, the, the soil is clay and it's with, with water on it, it makes it more difficult, more difficult. So sprinkling water, it's, you know, if, if, if that's something that people want to do, that it's also fine. But putting your branches well, yes, it's fine to put one on the, the head side and the, and the, and the <coughs> the feet side as well. Lastly, about repatriation and bombing. Now, this has alhamdulillah stopped. Repatriation is where we send the body to back home, to Bangladesh, Pakistan, India, to uh, our homeland, and people get buried there. So there's a process for embalming that the body goes to, where there's fluids, which is a mix of alcohol that is put inside the body to preserve the body, as well as sometimes even on the, in terms of the facial features, to where it's it's put on the certain types of things, uh, men, you know, chemicals, to preserve the body. Because the journey has to be like a two, three days you know, before the, uh, the disease is buried. But how that this has you know, stopped quite a lot now. It's stopped. But if somebody does have the thing of this, Islamically it is wrong. Islamically it is wrong totally. That the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has mentioned that you should get buried whenever you die. Islamically it is totally wrong. But also the process of it, it's not nice. It's, again, it's not respect to the disease. When a person dies, we should suddenly, you know, as, as quickly as possible, put the disease in the grave and, and, and you know, let, them, let them go to the hereafter. The longer we leave it, the, the process, it's more harming the other disease, harm the disease. So repatriation in Bambi is not allowed at all anyway. We should not do that. Okay? Now these are two types of graves. Now, the latter, which is the L-shape, Usually, in like Saudi, they do that. Um, and the L shape, like they, they put more and more tools, so they can stack up four or five bodies even at a time. In, in this country, we usually have shot or ship, which is a straight down uh, <coughs> see? straight, straight uh, hole. Now, usually, you know, we say six foot under the ground. That's, that's a quote we say. The graves are not took six foot. Uh, Burning, they take them four and a half foot four and a half foot, and the timber is put at four foot, so half a foot, or just over four, it's about three and a half foot the timber is put, so it's about four and a half foot, because digging six foot, what they do, in, in this country you can have a double grave, double grave, where a person can be buried eight foot under the ground, and then another person on top, sometimes people choose to do that, I mean, uh, Islamically, I don't know if it's right or wrong, but some people choose to do that, where they want to get buried with their loved ones, so they get, I think they do 12 foot, oh. no, 8 or 9 foot they do, and then then another one on top of 4 foot. So they, that's why in, in those who get a, a variance, you know, when anyone's passed away, and they get a, an invoice, it's say an opening of the grave. So if it's an opening of the grave, it's cheaper. But if it's a new grave, they have to take, it, it's more expensive. So it's basically you've paid for one already because they've opened it already once. But, um, so, like I mentioned, if it's a shower burial, so what you should happen is that the, when we see here, when we see here the, 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 the picture of the Janaza, the deceased, is facing towards the Qibla. It should be towards, more towards the Qibla as possible, even to a certain extent, even if it's putting the body towards the grey wall, towards the Qibla side. Yeah? But again, respecting the deceased, that's the main thing. That if it's difficult, where there's only three people and there's very small space there. Yeah? So that's what we're trying to say that to the cemetery, that if you can put the grave in such a manner that the soil is left at the bottom in a slant, where already the body is slanted and you put it there for the, for the shower burials. So again, this is advisable to do. That the, now, those who are buried inside the coffin, 
Yeah, some people say that you know they face the toward the, the face and the body as much as possible towards the Qibla in the coffin. In the coffin. Now, in terms of opening the shop, in some towns and cities, I've seen that what they do is at least the lid of the coffin they leave it a bit open, and then they bury the uh, deceased one like that. Well, that doesn't make sense because it's still in the coffin and in real a six foot four coffin that's for most coffin sizes and the height the length of the grave is about six and a half foot to six six point seven. You're not going only about five, six inches from each side. You don't have much space anyway. Well here and some even say that in terms of burial as well, that they leave the, uh, the face open. That's not necessary to do that. Okay. Um, now, oh, these are some things that were. So, Taziyat is where uh, consoling the family members. Taziyat is only allowed for three days. When the person passes away. From when the person passes away. Not from when the person is buried. As soon as the person passes away, you take for three days, 72 hours, Taziyat should be advisable. Now, in terms of Taziyat, where family members come. Now, it is good to do that. Morning and, and taking take that out mentally is good as well. But it should not be the fact that it becomes a gobshop every where we sit in the masjid or the hall and we just talk about saying, yes, you, you, to console the person in uh, the family, you talk good about the deceased and you, you try to help them. Then. But the main thing to do is recite Quran, recite certain things which will spiritually help the deceased. Um, on that note, well, in terms of the tazir, tazir is, well, um, is that the food, anything that is prepared for in, in the tazir or even paid for the hall, that should not become the deceased person's money. I should not be the deceased person. The reason why is when a person dies, the only thing that should cover before the money is distributed amongst the heads is cover the janazah. The minimal janazah, which is the burial, the coffin, the ghusl, that's it. These are extra things, like right? food and shibni or whatever we call it. These things should not be from the deceased person's money. It, should, it can be from the family member's money. That's fine. That's fine. So that's one thing to remember, that a lot of families, what they do, they pay for it from the deceased person. Really. So you're thinking the fact that, yes, this is more rewarding for the deceased. But in fact, that money is not owned by the deceased anymore. That money has gone to the heirs. Uh, distribution of food for, uh, for the day and the funeral, which I've spoken about. The structures in the grave, that's the grave stones. Now, in terms of, Islamically, it's okay to have a simple grave stone on top just to mark the name and the number, that's fine. But having a structure, a big, uh, massive structure, it is not allowed. It is not allowed to do that. Okay? Um, visiting the graveyard. Um, it's advisable to visit the graveyard as much as possible, especially on the day of Jum'ah, the day of Eid. Try to visit the graveyard frequently, especially with your youngsters. Go there and that will remind them of death more and more. And it will, it will be a way or source of Sadaqah Jariya for those who are buried there as well. Um, and there are sunnah du'as that uh, we enter the, enter, enter the graveyard to recite um, you know, the, the way of what, the things to pray, praise God, Yaseen, and so forth. But when it comes to du'a, when it comes to du'a, try to face towards the qibla and do the du'a. Do not face the, the grave and do du'a. Face the qibla and do the du'a. Now, this, the, I'll finish off with this. I'll leave this, I'll leave this after the uh, practice. So now we'll stop, inshallah. Uh, has anybody got any questions? A final more questions. So, yeah, that's um, what we have in, uh, again in terms of the graves, there are four types of graves. Four types of graves. So there are the two ways of putting the grave, the shift or the shaft and the lahat, which is the L shape. We don't have that in this country. So we have the straight one. So in terms of the straight one, we have the four types. One is, and it's called an earthen grave. So earthen grave is uh, Chester. I don't know if you're very Chester, they do it in Chester. Nice. Where they just dig the grave and they don't put any timber at all. SubhanAllah, it's closer to the sunnah because they don't do any timber at all. Yeah? But it all depends, this all depends on the soil, on the soil that is. So one is called an earthen grave. Second one is called a timber vault. So timber vault, sometimes Burnley do it, sometimes black one do it. Because they have, black one especially, they have sandy, the, the soil is very sandy. So 
So the, what, the, what happens is that the site is all timber and the top is timber. The third one is semi-timber. So what we have most of the time is basically they have a, 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 where we put planks of wood just before on top of the body, about, about half, 10 inches, about 5, 6 inches above the body. There's timbers that is put and then the soil goes on top. Yeah? Soil goes on top. And the last fourth one is called a vault. So usually in Rosendale and in Nelson they do vaults. Now in Rosendale they do it for the right reason. Because in Rosendale the cemetery gets flooded. Flooded so much so the water, I, I, I didn't, even in vaults they used to be like above say, four or five foot, so much water. So when it gets flooded so much, the bodies and the the, the cancer the burials. So with the vault, what happens? That because when there's so much water that's coming, even though the body is four or five foot underneath, the body still moves. Body moves. To stop that, they put a vault. So a vault is where they have concrete slabs, you know, breeze blocks, four walls, and underneath as well concrete, and on top concrete as well. But in Nelson, they do this, and even in Burnley, they try to do this. You know, Alhamdulillah, it, it, it took a lot, a lot of hard work. Even now, they do some of our uh, council members try to push this is because it's very good money for the council. Because a vault grave costs more. In, in Nelson, for example, um, the last one, before they put this extra cost on, an urban grave would cost £1,700, 1700 pounds, and a vault would cost three and a half grand. So look at the difference of money council are making. So, it's, so the vault grave, yes, by all means, you know, sadly, some of our families, we try to explain this to the deceased family members. They, you know, they have the impression that the, you know, you know, they think that the more expensive grave that we have, the more rewarding it's for the deceased. It's not. It's not. Remember this. You know, um, when we did this funeral awareness course, I, I asked the pathology students that when you put a deceased in a coffin on the ground, how long does it take for that body to decompose? Because the natural way of decompose Causing anything is that the soil has to touch that body, or soil has to touch that fruit or whatever. So apparently they did a study with an apple in, in a veneer wood because this is veneer wood. So even, you know, if you put a kitchen cabinet outside in your back street, how long does it take <coughs> in, in rain, sunshine, everything to decompose fully? It'll take about five, six years. Age, imagine this. So this is underneath the ground in the veneer wood. How long will it take to decompose the body with like that? It will not decompose, it will rot. It will literally rot. And the veneer wood would decompose after a certain amount of time. Then the body will be touched with the soil. That's why shroud burial is more appropriate because why? The, 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 the decomposing of the body is faster. With the vault, what happens? Because underneath is concrete, four sides is concrete, top is concrete, even the soil they use is not soil, it's gravel. You know, if you have weather pitch before, down stone, if you remember that, grey stone. That's what they use. It's a mixture of soil and, and, and gravel. That's what they put in. So even then, and they don't, the most of the, they do not allow sharp burials in them anyway. So the vault grave is totally against if it's not necessary. The Rosendale is necessary because, or else the graves move. The whole body moves because of the amount of water and some slope. Yeah? So in Nelson, I mean, I, you, they, what the council do, they will dig, say, 50, 60 graves at a time. And now they don't even build it anymore. Before they used to, I, I remember they used to build it there and then you know, they used to get builders and they used to build them. But now they just get pre, uh, it's like molds, a, a, a crane comes, and they just put it in, that's it. So it's, it's very easy money for the council, but it's against the sunnah for it. And it's giving you know, more to leave to the deceased. So these are the different types. So try to avoid the vault as much as possible. If it does come to Burnley, please you know, fight against it because child burial for us is a right for the Muslim. It is close to the sunnah. As much as possible, we can do that. As much as possible. So that's one of the questions that came up that different types of grief. In Burnley Cemetery, the sign specifically mentioned that facing grave and back towards the tibula is considered a bit out. I, I, don't, I, I haven't noticed that, sorry. Uh, if that is the case, it's new. I haven't noticed that. What was the question again? In Burnley Cemetery, the signs are specifically mentioned to face the grave and back towards the fibula. It is considered bid'ah. Sorry, uh, we are putting a sign up in the new cemetery site, 
you know, we've spoken to the council, we've spoken to them yesterday as well. So we're going to put a new sign up there with, for the du'as, and so now we are uh, entering the, the, uh, the new sign. And the old one will be replaced as well. So that definitely will be taken away. So we've got permission now, so we're going to be, be, be submitting, we're going to submit that soon as well. Are there any other questions, anybody? Keep up. They're not advising. But it's not a matter of allowed or not. They don't advise to do that. But with the district nurse, what happens is that the, that body has to be uh, examined by the doctor again, or just to confirm by the doctor. So, for example, if that person had a long term illness, and the district nurse has been for, for, say, four or five weeks, so that obviously that medical record has been shared with the GP. So, if that cause of death and the medical record matches, the GP has, doesn't have to literally come out to see the body. Yeah? In terms of keeping the body, even the district nurse, I mean, most of it will be in the home anyway. I mean, when district nurse, when, when, when a person passes away, it's usually, usually at home. So, or the, or the hospice. If it's at the hospice, they usually take it to Burnley, let's say Blackburn Mall, or even Burnley as well, because it's very small. But if it's a district nurse, usually the body is at home anyway. You understand? So, I, I don't be, both is, you are like, you can't keep it home, it's advisable not to, by the by the very clear and appropriate place. Any other questions, anybody? Uh, Sheikh, you know, just wanted to ask about the mahram veil, mahram issue you mentioned before. How does that apply in the case of husband and wife? Because I've heard a masala about when, when, when one of the spouse dies, the rule of, uh, about the nikah also ends. So one thing's seeing and one thing's washing. See, th this is what I'm saying. This is what I'm saying. Every scenario would be different. I mean, me, that's why I, I mean, personally, you know, specifically, certain things I didn't mention. Because the reason why is every scenario would be different in that way. Yes, one is not allowed, one is allowed. That's understandable. Not everything uh, can be given to one fatwa, shall I say. I, I, to me, it, it, you have to look at it in terms of who, um, what the scenario is. But as a general rule, can the husband see the wife or, or the wife see the husband once they die? As a general rule. Uh, it's different if it's COVID and they haven't one, seen each other for months or whatever. But as a general, because uh, is it true that the nikah finishes at the death? The one last note. One last note. Okay. Okay. <laughs> is that okay? Is that one last note? Yeah. 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 But the, the thing is, in this country, in this country is very different, very different in this country. So, for example, in the, in the for example, yeah, that you've got, then you've got mental issues and all that. I mean, we've seen relapses of that because the woman is not allowed to because of the intent, mm -hmm. where they've gone through a mental breakdown such a way that they've ended up worse. So where, where, where I mean, where, so it's all, uh, you know, the, as a general rule, it's fine. But then you have to look at specific. specific so specific. just, just a quick follow up. No, that's right. So if, for example, the husband dies, then you know, like, for example, so you take the body home, and the wife can see. The, the wife will see, but the wife can't come to like the center. She should, she, she should not. Come. Okay. She should not come. Okay. This is just a quick one because um, many hospitals, it's not a very small portion here. Yeah. Four or five. Yeah, that's how So if a person passes away in many hospital, the body's kept here. So the, the, the green yeah. issue from. So, so the staff from Blackburn Cemetery, the mortuary, they come and open it. Yeah. You can just collect from here, yeah? yeah. Okay. But that's very rarely the use. Yeah, it's not four, four, four. It's just a very small yeah. one. Small five inches. Yeah. 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 In the green city, you mentioned, who issues that? Registration. Registration office. The, and so they issue the death certificate and the green certificate. Yeah. Both. So, that's the, so that certificate you keep yeah. as a record. Yeah. So how you have a birth certificate, yeah. it's exact same with okay. for the death certificate. And who do you give the green certificate to? Because the green certificate will body. be given to the cemetery right. and to release the body. Yeah, and then that will be the record that is being yeah. buried. So after the, after, uh, once you give it to the cemetery, yeah. so that you never see that again. You just, you uh, it's, it. gone. It's, but it's, it's, it's more of a digital thing now. Yeah, yeah. It's a digital yeah. format. Any questions, anybody? Mm -hmm.
Just yeah. quickly, yeah. Um, I know the laws are changing around organ donations and stuff, where right. if you're not sort of opted in or out, what's the latest on what that is and what the ruling is? I don't know. No? I know there's one of the imams, my doctor, he's doing a bioethics paper on that. Right. Um, he came here a couple of years ago and he gave yeah. a speech on that. Yeah, he's doing, he's doing, he's doing a paper on that. But then there's some people overruling the Jamal. Some people overruling as well. Any other questions? So what we'll do, inshallah, what we'll do is I'll try to quickly some of the things that can be utilised or should be utilised within the Muslim. I'll try and go through that now, and then inshallah we'll get about four or five volunteers, about six volunteers, um, to go through the ghusl, uh, and they can inshallah help out with the job. Uh, the, uh, the <laughs> no, no, his name is with the job. <laughs> right, so in, in terms of ghusl, so firstly you have um, the PPE, that, the basic thing that you utilize, which is aprons, disposable aprons, and disposable gloves. You can also have masks, there's different types of aprons that we have. But then also in terms of disposing of the rubbish, like big bags, different types of big bags that you can have for sharp objects, you have a thicker bag, or for uh, wet things that you have a thicker bag, so different types of big bags that you can have. But then, um, so then we have also the scissors, these are quite important, surgical scissors are quite good, but then with scissors as well, so that's to cut the clothes, the disease. Most of the time, they come in a body bag. Um, so the body bag is in a zip. And they have their night gown on, the hospital gown on. You have to sometimes put that off. Um, then you also have different types. So the ghusl, when you do the ghusl, there's three types of water. One is the plain water, one is the camphor water, one is a soapy water, or a, like a disinfectant water. Now that, today's day, they use shampoo or soap, or in the sunnah way, I don't know how to explain, but there's a, uh, the citrus leaves of these things, or the harut uh, and other types of elements that they used to use, which can also be utilized now. In today's day, you can get soaps and powders made of this. It's good to, if you have it, it's good to utilize that. That's close to the sun. Um, but, so these are the three, type, three types. So you've got the, um, the camphor, kaboo, or mothballs. Um, you, you, you need to stop them. Now, and there's a different types of tools. For, for example, um, there's a handy by the dentist, dentist, dentistry uh, thing where you, tell, you use these for the mouth. It's quite bigger in a, in a way, just to clean the mouth and wash the mouth. Yeah. Then you can also utilize earbuds, um, stuff like that, to um, clean the ears as well as the nose, um, any of the part you know, between the fingernails. Remember, oh, sorry, one, one thing to note uh, with the fingernails. However, a person passes away, that's what we have to leave. So if a person has not cleansed their or shaved their armpit or the pubic hair, we have to leave that. If after the death, you cannot shave that. If a person has not clipped their nails, you cannot clip their nails. Okay? You have to leave it like how they have died. So that the, the way they die, that's how you have to send them off. Okay? Um, the other things that we have is also, sometimes wounds are quite heavy. So the best thing to utilize it's a spray that the uh, doctor gave me. Basically, it's, it's a cold spray. It's actually, it's, it stops the bleeding quite fast. And then, then you put a special plastic. We've run out of the very expensive plastic. Uh, we had it in COVID time. It's got a high pound of plastic. But you put it on and it stops the wound quite fast. But that doesn't stop if, it's, if the wound is quite deep. So we usually utilize uh, sanitary towels. Sanitary towels is quite. Uh, it's good, it absorbs the blood quite well, so you utilize that way to use medical tea. So these are some of the things, and then, yeah, I mean, you know, sometimes you need a grinder, if a woman has jewelry on, uh, sometimes you need demolition movers, or even plastic removers, you know, these things are secondary. Now, the most important things that are required for the hospital is something for the extinguisher. Okay? When a person, when you, you cleanse the person, um, how to wipe that. Um, some people use fan and towel, towels, people use pieces of cloth. But what we tend to utilize is for these bed mats. Um, so we we'll cut into three, and then because one side is absorbent and the other side is uh, water, water, water. 
So it's, you just put it around the hand and you uh, put it in there. Um, and then you've got the opaque cloths, which is for the, to cover the sun. And then you've got the kafa, which is three pieces of the five pieces, which I will explain. And then you've got the towels. So these are simple things that for, and also bakhur or agarbati, incense sticks for bakhur. Uh, these are things that we utilize. Then the process now, inshallah, I will, if we can have four or five volunteers and then. So, this is our Muslim team that we have. Yeah? So, what happens is that when um, Mr. Bariatris, when we go to collect the body, we pick the body up from the mortuary. Now, um, when we go to pick the body up, we can take this stretcher and this is. Underneath the stretcher, we have a, a scoop and we have the body in a body bag as well as on a, on a stretcher. Now, this stretcher that we have, this one is a new one, uh, um, which is a two man stretcher. The other one we have, which is a better one, it's a one man stretcher, so one person can not pick the body. But this is only two people, because it doesn't collapse with one person. So, now with the scoop, this we the scoop is utilized for shroud burial because it's metal. So, we take the, to, that, to the cemetery and we can put it on the floor. It's yes, dirty, it's quite easy to clean. So when we, put, when we get the body, when we pick the body, you always remember that we respectfully cover the body. So we have these covers, we have about three of them, black ones and red ones that we have. Respectfully cover the body. Okay? Always respectfully cover the body if you're one of the volunteers, cover the body. Now when you come to the the must is for Husserl, in Burnley, this is, if you can just put it on the side. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. This is the ideal scenario of a whistle table. Where the whistle table is like this, and the body comes like this. So the head side is there, and the feet are here. This is the ideal way of doing it, best way. Where you have three volunteers on this side, and three on this side. Where you pick the body, and you go together like that. Yeah? But in Burnley, all of the whistle areas, none of them are like that. Okay? My just take the body there. So in Burnley, we have it like this because of the space. We have the whistle table and we have to put the body on this side. And it's more difficult. It's very difficult. Okay? Because, yes, it's quite uh, flush with the, the, the stretch and the thing is flush. But if it's a heavy body, it's quite difficult, sometimes very difficult to pick the body. So we will we'll go through like that. So Andy, I'll give it to Habzuma and inshallah he'll go through the process of what we do. So before we do that, sorry, before we do that, we're going to we'll uh, prepare ourselves, shall I say. We'll put some aprons on. Them aprons look familiar. <laughs> Uh, secondly, also, um, 
So then, and I'll leave you to have his money, inshallah. He'll go through the process, and inshallah, we will be with you, inshallah. First of all, it's mentioned in the hadith that whenever we do action, you should know what the virtues of doing the action, why we do it, when you have to do it. So this is farbi kifaya. So the people who are doing it, they're doing it, uh, uh, the farbi kifaya, they are taking responsibility and stopping the whole community from being sinful by taking the responsibility of uh, giving wussas and janazah, etc. So it's a form of uh, worship, a form of the world as well. As Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned, he to this effect that a person who obeyed the disease and also put the kafal on and perfumes the body and doesn't reveal any secrets of that person who passed away, then he's forgiven like a person who's newly born. So this is virtues we keep in, in the back of our mind if we want it. Is the people who are popular people, well known in the community, people, there's loads of volunteers ready to wash this money. And people who are from the family, like the river, brothers and sisters, and nobody turns up because they're not, uh, nobody knows them. But they, these virtues from life, they should entice us and they should encourage us to be the person who is fulfilling the duty on behalf of the community and also on the reward as well. Okay, so in terms of process, what is Ghusl? Just a summary first and then we can understand what's going on. In basic terms, all we're doing is the person who passed away, we are doing Istinja first, and then we're doing Budu, and then we give the Ghusl. Ghusl means having a bath, pouring water over the whole body. That's it in simple terms. Istinja, the Budu, and Ghusl. Then we put the Kafal on the person, and that's the process of Ghusl. Well, it's a bit more detailed, inshallah, we'll come up with in terms of detail, that who should do, who should give the ghusl first? Because we leave it to the imams, we leave it to uh, other experienced people who um, you do it and just say, okay, we leave it to them. But who has the right, who should do it? Who should take the step forward? And it's a mutual honor as well. It should be that, for example, it's a father's pastor, a son, and brother, or a father, a son, brother. These kind of people, they should take the lead, and they should to uh, the Muslim first of all. And then if they sometimes they're really scared, they should still be present, and if not, then give it to other people. But we should, uh, as I mean, in, the, in terms of honor, this is our, the people who passed away, we owe uh, them at least something that they've done so much for us in their lifetime, that we are there to uh, wash the body, have the honor washing the body. And also, you have to remember this, uh, this washing that we're doing, it's quite, it's, but we're going to trust that, no, we're not going to physically trust the private passport, it's a, a certain amount of respect that's uh, required. And these two things have to be taken into account when giving the Ghusas. The Quran the Ghusas is the, the setter of the person should be covered throughout. The dignity of the, uh, the disease should be preserved throughout. This means not letting the, uh, the body be uh, uncovered from the navel, very better to the knees. This needs to be uh, remembered at all, throughout the whole state. Sometimes it slips, sometimes uh, we have to do certain things. Uh, if you're not in the private area, do it without looking. And uh, there's certain things that you can help without, uh, which thing would make it easier in terms of really washing the private parts, etc. So now I'm just going to go through the method. Uh, this is what I'm reading here, if anybody wants it afterwards, I'm to serve the platform taking it from his uh, article. So number one, it's better to make intention of bearing the disease. The intention you already discussed what kind of intention you can make and we're gonna uh, give a person to that maybe. When the people decide to bear the disease, they should put him on a broad bench, like the one that you can see. So this is the one, when the person who from Husserl, for Husserl, and the, the volunteers, they bring him on a stretcher. So our first job is to transfer the body over to the the wash basin, the, the, the basin that we made for Muslim. So now, before we carry on, we'll do that. There's certain different ways. One of us has mentioned about the going from this side to that side, you can put your hand underneath and go across. But in our masjid, they, they're square. So you have to, there's a lot of this going on where you have to do from side to side. Now, what I recommend for the masjid to invest in is called, it's called a part side. It's like a plastic, the same dimension as the table, plastic, small board. You took it in underneath the, the disease, 
and then we just slide that person across. Yeah, yeah. Is it yeah. Yeah, so each web, whichever question doesn't have one, it's called a pack slide. You can get the link or whatever. This is very useful. And it also saves you having to lift the body and there's less risk of you know, dropping the body or anything like that. You know. That's the first thing. So now we'll just move the body across. Feel the shape or feel 
the feeling of the travel part. So do that. Wrap it around. Isolate it one. And make it thick enough that you don't feel the body part when you are washing it. Now here what we need is a couple of guys uh, just to hold the sheet up without looking at it, without exposing the body. One person who's doing the esthesia and that person, uh, imagine you're doing your own esthesia. One thing that helps with the washing the body here is the person put on the feet side and he uh, spread the legs out side to side. Not as good as it, but even if you lift them, then this is basically what uh, helps with the esthesia area. So whatever you can reach, whatever you can, whatever you can reach, And then move on to the left arm, left side. 
can get no one in the end. You can just do it once. Oh, yeah, well, it's just, just a long time. <coughs> okay, then after, what's next after the art in Mudu? Masa. Masa. So uh, one person, a little bit of water in palm and Masa. Okay. We have it. Okay. I said, and then I'll put both feet. So right foot, left foot. In between the toes, sometimes the toes be tied together. Why do you use your small finger? Yes. 
Well, before the before you take before you start also as well, from the time up, it's actually in the state of wudu. It's going to be state of wudu. And if there is a salah timing close by, so for example, if there's only half an hour left, or 45 minutes, one hour left for asr, pray the salah first just in case your qaza, your namaz is qaza. Remember this. A lot of times, especially COVID time, when we had when one, one Muslim after another. So we, we, took, we, we made that proportion the fact that even though if I miss the mark, we might be because of that. At least your namaz doesn't become qada. Because if you take a ghusl after that, yeah? So always remember that. If you take a ghusl after that, then um, you can cook for the janazah prayers. So after the janazah prayers, then we take the, the body disease to the burial site and we bury the body. So that's, that's basically it. So this is the process of, in terms of burial and the ghusl. Um, just before, you um, can sit down. We've just got uh, two more slides that we're finding this issue and we finish it up. So, when a death does occur, when a death does occur, this is, if you, if you can take, if brothers, if you can take notice of this, this is the most important thing of everything. For the person at the end of life, we should have them. At least their date of birth, the, the, the spelling of their, the correct spelling of their names, um, the address. These are three things that we should always have. Secondly, also, is that their GP, who is their GP and the GP's address. And the third thing is any medical history, simple medical history that you should know about, okay, diabetes, <coughs> cancer, and so forth. That's the first thing. So those of us who have elderly parents, um, grandparents, please, please make a note of this. It's very important. Secondly, is that if it occurs at home, if it occurs at home, first thing you do is call 999 and call the paramedics, call the ambulance. Uh, if the patient's at home, if, the, if it's a uh, same thing, anything outside the hospital, anything outside the hospice or the hospital, if it's an accident outside, at work, whatever, call the paramedics. The third thing to do is contact your GP. And the Muslim burial trust or whichever funeral service you are going to utilize. Yeah? That's the third point of contact. Or th sorry, third point, third thing to do. So the first point of contact is the paramedics. If it's at home, the paramedics will automatically inform the police, and the police will, you don't have to call the police or anybody. And when the police come, usually, I come to that, the police, uh, they will contact us first. If it's a Muslim uh, death within Burnley, they will contact us anyway. Uh, so they, they will contact us. Uh, or if it's a uh, non-suspicious death outside in a work of contact the GP. Or the last medical uh, exam, sorry, uh, consultant or doctor, whoever's seen the patient last. Yeah? So it has to, is it 23 days? Yeah, yes. 28 days. So if a doctor, if a doctor, if a GP has seen a patient within the last 28 days, you can consult them. So if, for example, if a patient has gone to a hospital for three days and then come back, yeah? Even if you can have a, say 20 days, they can, they can sign off the, death, the, the, uh, as a, uh, the medical certificate. Yeah? They don't physically have to see the body. Yeah? Even to a certain extent, some of them even accept a video call. A video call accepts. Well, that, that's a bit rolled out now. But more to 28 days, within 28 days, they, we have a doctor, whichever doctor has seen that patient, they can cont uh, contact them. So we'll contact the GP. Um, if it's out of our service, you don't have to do that. Then you just contact the uh, NBT representative and the Imam. So you contact the local Imam or the Muslim committee members just to inform that whichever mystic you're going to be um, utilizing for the Ghusl and the, the, the funeral prayers, so they inform in that sense. <coughs> so, yeah. so, sorry. You've lost connection. Mm. Is that we um, arrange for the hustle and the burial and the process of that? So always remember this: these four or five things. The first thing is have the contact details of your loved ones or your close family members. GP, um, GP's name and address. Secondly, also is that of um, 
contact the paramedics. Thirdly is that um, you contact the GP and the Imam. And the lastly is that you're in for the ghusl, yeah? My last request of the slide that we have here, but um, I don't know. Very interest. We are a voluntary service. Okay? We are a voluntary service, and the only way we can run is with volunteers. You know, um, we struggle to find volunteers at times to where we can help our communities. We've tried, Alhamdulillah, we've been running for five years and we've kept it free. We, uh, you know, it's, it's on donation basis, whichever family members they want to donate. This is the, our, the structure that we have so far. So we have an admin team. So in the admin team, we're consulting sort of with the coroner's office, or booking, booking of the graves, even on the maintenance of the vehicles and so forth. And then we have a Burnley and a Ben Pendle. So usually Maid and Hafiz Fatim, who are the, usually the contact. Um, in Rosendale, we have sales buyers with the Javed. So these two, we, we liaise with. And the idea is, the, the perfect scenario idea is that every single Muslim Every single Muslim have their own dispatch team. So, for example, if there is a death which is accredited towards Abu Bakr Muslim, or Sefaruki Azam, or Darwinista, whichever Muslim it is, they have one contact. So, in your community, in your own congregation, the Imam is not the contact only. One person is in contact. So, if a death happens, which is a Muslim or Abu Bakr Muslim, you have a poster outside. If a death occurs from a Muslim, contact him. So, that person then engages with those, that's it. What happens now is that we get 20 phone calls from different committee members, different imams, and different things, and it, it, it just slows the process down. This is the ideal scenario that every single now, the majority, a lot of brothers here from Abu Bakr if you if you're in your committee meeting, if you appoint somebody from the funeral side, this way it will be a process so easy. Ghosia Masjid is the only Masjid that has done that. Haji Talib Sahib, solid guy, mashallah, Allah gave him everything. You know, in Ghosia Masjid, any person who dies, he's the person only to contact. The whole of the Ghosia Masjid community knows that. Every Masjid should have this. That one person is contacted. It's not, you know, sometimes people still call me. I mean, in London, people still call me. People call uh, my people call whoever it is. It's fine. I mean, we, we still help. But the ideal scenario is that every Masjid have this. It doesn't matter who it is. Yeah? One person, have your name and number there. That if a death occurs in our communities, contact the person. And then we will work, we will work towards that. The, the, the benefit of that is that it's a similar, similar face, a familiar face to the community and the Muslims. It can be the Imam, it can be a community member, it can be anybody. Secondly, so this is the ideal scenario that we should want. The last is that you have a pool of volunteers. You have 50, 60, 70, each Muslim has hundreds of youngsters, elders. You know, those who are taxi drivers, they work at night with their free in the morning. Those who are medical experts, they work at morning to day, you know, free in the evening. Have different types of volunteers who are available on weekends, who are available on the weekdays, you know, bank holidays, different types of volunteers. You only need about 20. And like I said, like I said, in each community, in each masjid, you probably have five deaths a year. So you you only get five calls a year, that's it. But this uh, this this way, what will happen is smoothen the service, as well as it's a thing that everybody knows about. No, especially those brothers and sisters who come over new to Burnley, you know. At least they know that, you know, even you've got a lot of students who come from uh, the college and university. If, the, if a death occurs there, they usually Muslim is our Bukhara Muslim. A lot of them are Muslim is our Bukhara Muslim, Shadal Muslim. If they don't know about it, you know, what, this, what, what, what should they do? You know, it's carry on contacting us. But at least this way, this service that we've kept trying to keep free, it will carry on. What's happening now is a lot of strain on our volunteers, you know, there's only a few. Same five, six brothers who have to leave work, you know, they have to leave work and they have to do this. Sometimes, you know, they have to leave routines and certain types of things. If you can give certain uh, hours of the day, hours of the week, that's something. Even if it's once a month, once a month you say, Marana, I have once a month, I have off. Any death occurs in that day of the month, 20th of the month, I will do. That's enough. If we have 30 people like that, that's more than enough. So that way we can roll out and carry on. So please, my, my humble request 
is that every masjid try to choose one person as a contact for and then you run a pool of volunteers with you. Yeah, no. Brothers and sisters. You know, we've struggled sometimes to find Muslim volunteers for Muslims. I mean, our Muslim burial trust does not take the responsibility of Muslims anything. It's we fund each Muslim now to have their own Muslim team. So it's, you, should, you should always have prepared that, that if, if a Muslim was to come to your team, the Muslims, what do we do? What do we do? So please, this is our, uh, like I said, the, inshallah, the end goal is that we don't just run in Burnley and Kendall and Rosendale. We go towards everywhere, inshallah. That inshallah. way, with this free service, this is donation basis only, inshallah, you will carry on. Inshallah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept our second. Allah Amen. subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make this a means of such fayjariya for us. And, you know, a further kifaya, like Muran Umar mentioned, that we are fulfilling for the ummah here, for our communities here. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you, inshallah. Amen. And if you want to volunteer, if you want to donate anything, our number is quite simple, 078 57 58 59 60. Just message that we will send you a, a um, electronic form and then just fill that in and we have your details on there. So that, on that form it says that what hours you're available, what days you're available and so forth. Um, if, uh, anything you want to know about, you can contact us on mbt at communityoutreach.uk.org or the details are on our, the, all the banners and shops. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.